Pat. Where's Pat? We're waiting on Pat. What a sorry group of motherfuckers this is. Good to see you. How's my hair look? Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Bay Area Wrestling. My name is Pat Kelly. I was the commentator at ringside, ring announcer, and interviewer of Bay Area Wrestling. Well, John Kelly. No, no, my name is Pat Kelly. What? I'm Radical Robbie Lee. What? Come May 16th, man, you're gonna have a real big surprise. The heartthrob of Bay Area Wrestling. My name is Rich Armas. There is no room in this business for pencil neck pansies. I'm the mask, and I can still kick your asses. I'm Alan Bolte. I, along with Pat Kelly, did the color commentating. My name is Woody Farmer. And I'm the great May Young. She's working that leg over. She's working time. that leg over. There's a newcomer on the Bay Area wrestling scene. I used my actual real name. It was Janet Jason Rogers. He is always ready for the fans and his competition. My name is Danny Garcia. And look at this guy up on the top rope watching. What a shot. Super Diablo. They're going toe to toe now as Hernandez fights back. I'm Jesse Hernandez. He's as nice out of the ring as he is tough inside the ring. Johnny Starr. They're really working Johnny Starr over. What can be said when the man enters the ring with the belt? He's the champion. I'm the one and only Shane Cody. Agility and a strong desire to win make him a tremendous athlete. Johnny Pearson. Crash Holly. A lot of the guys who became big worked for Woody. Earliest memory I can remember is being at the tapings watching Chris Jericho, his first time on TV there. Across the ring goes Jericho. I'm Chris Jericho, and I briefly had a stint in Bay Area Wrestling. Woodrow Woody Farmer, a professional wrestler, promoter, and stuntman was born on December 25th, 1935, in Buchanan County, Virginia. What a lot of people may not know is Woody was an orphan at a very young age. Didn't have much, uh, much of an education. In the 1960s, after serving in the Army, Woody decided to give professional wrestling a try and started his training under California Bay Area legends Ray Stevens Pepper Gomez, and Kenji Shibuya. He began wrestling for one of the biggest promotions in the country, Roy Shire's NWA Big Time Wrestling, and got to wrestle across the United States and internationally in Australia and Japan. Woody was one of Roy Shire's draws. When the territory was here, all of Northern California, from like five to 12 years old, every summer I'd travel with them. And I was to Texas, Mexico, uh, North and South Carolina, Oklahoma. Never thought I was going to end up being a wrestler. In the late 60s, Woody Farmer and Reggie Parks won the AWA Midwest Tag Team titles. And in 1971, Woody won the NWA Western Tag Team titles with his partner, Bobby Duncombe Sr. Today, he still astonishes crowds with the stunts he pulls at charitable appearances. He'd do his strongman's where he'd bend his metal around his arm. In addition to pro wrestling, Woody was a strongman and was known for his tremendous feats of strength, including breaking a 400-pound concrete block on his chest while lying on a bed of nails. Professional wrestler, stuntman, and here he comes with a 300-pound spinning piano on his back. At 48 years old, he carried a piano up San Francisco's famous Lombard Street to raise money for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. The pace is steady and strong. He trained hard for months for it. And I worked with my dad. My dad owned a, a piano moving business. He'd have the dumbbell and he'd have a bunch of weights and he'd be walking the park a lot at work, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It was so successful. It was on Channel 7. It was on the news. And here he has the final steps. Yes. Successfully, successfully made 500 steps more up Lombard Street, he collapses. For him doing that, carrying that piano up Lombard Street, it sent a bunch of kids to a camp. 
everyone trying to get a look at the mountain man who actually carried that piano. He's getting up now. He seems to be all right. He made it. Amazing. 500 steps for the MDA. Just a great man. A really, really great man. Salt of the earth, give you the shirt off his back type of guy. Oh, he was a great guy. Great guy. Would do anything for you. I mean, if you had a problem, if there was a way that that man could help you, God, God be it, he would. He was a very easygoing guy unless you pissed him off. <laughs> Holy shit. Woody was also featured in local Bay Area wrestling television commercials and three motion pictures. Your name on names here with the key to the city. This is Alan, Joe. Alan Hollis. It's the next green parade. No, nine tours. You gotta be crazy. Yeah, I loved it. In the late 70s, Woody opened the doors of his own wrestling school in Hayward, California, where he trained local Northern California talents, such as his son, Hawkeye Shane Cody, Jason Stiles, Super Diablo, and former WWE star Crash Holly, among countless others. Woody School had class, okay? It, there was a lot of class in Woody School, and there was respect. Woody, uh, you have to be absolutely thrilled about Bay Area wrestling and the young talent we're seeing in the ring on the show. From 1989 to 1993, Woody owned and operated Bay Area Wrestling, doing TV tapings at Channel 6 in Newark, California. Woody's philosophy was you get one go around in life, make the most of it. And that he did. They're coming. Wait a minute. Get out of here. Get out of here. Woody's going to go after Bay Young. He's going to go after the headband. I can't believe the pandemonium has broken out. Woody Farmer, you have to be looking forward to the action in Pittsburgh, California, Saturday night, May 16th. Bay Area Wrestling got going shortly after I met Woody Farmer, uh, maybe within one or two years. And now the way Woody and I met and the way I came into the business is, um, is an interesting story. Bay Area Wrestling, why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you get another suit? I guess. Nobody likes the even suit I'm wearing tonight. Wrestling was just getting into its heyday. Uh, Vince McMahon had torn down the territories um, and syndicated wrestling was huge on television. There were a lot of promoters in a lot of areas of the country that decided that they would get a piece of that pie. So a guy came into uh, Stockton, California, where I was working at this radio station, and uh, he was going to be uh, running a card at the Stockton Civic Auditorium. And uh, I was assigned by what's called the pro production director of the radio station to produce his radio spot for him. And so we got to talk, and then I told him about how I was a fan as, as a kid, just what I explained. <clears throat> My first ma match was uh, live wrestling, was at the Cow Palace with Ray and Pep in the main, and... He says, well, how'd you like to be my ring announcer? And I thought, well, shit, are you kidding me? I'll be the kid that grew up and got to join the circus. I show up at the Stockton Civic Auditorium, and I think it was just about this time of year, January of 1986. And uh, it's a sold out house, 4,500, 5,000 people. This is my first night in the business, and I'm gonna be the ring announcer. And I said, this is where I belong. I think, I, I think this is cool. I like this business. After the matches were over that night, Woody Farmer came up to me and he said, he said, Pat, how, how come I've never seen you before? You know, meaning how come he'd never seen me in the business? And I said, well, Woody, I said, I, I gotta come clean to you, man. I, this was this is my first night in the business. I, this is the first time I've done ring announcing professional wrestling. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, Pat, you, you, I tear up a little bit. He said, you belong in this business. And if it weren't for Woody Farmer, and that night, I, I don't know if <clears throat> I would have ever ended up in the business of professional wrestling. Let's first welcome to the ring area, the colorful Danny Garcia. <laughs> I didn't really start with Woody Farmer. I started with Alexis Smiroff and Jerry Monty and IWF. Uh, I met Rex on a wrestling show, and he asked me to come over there because they, didn't, they weren't treating me right there, and it wasn't a really good school. So then uh, 
I went to the show with Rex, and we were on the same show, and he introduced me to his dad, and that's how I ended up with Bear Wrestling. He's in there taking a big beating, and he's telling him what a man he is. Yeah, that's because the referee's letting Danny Garcia get away with murder. Look at that. When I first started there, I was a single, and then we became the Garcia brothers, me and my nephew. And then I went on to be Danny Garcia by myself. The one I liked most was Danny Garcia, you know, because I got to express myself. Up goes the Eliminator Suplex. Garcia hooks the leg, and he gets the win. A very decisive and important win for the colorful Danny Garcia this evening. And his opponent this evening is the very mysterious El Diablo. My uncle is Danny Garcia, and um, he was in the business uh, about a year, or year, about two years maybe before I was. I would go with him all the time because I was only like 14 years old, so I was going with him to his practices. And I started in the IWF uh, with Smirnoff um, before I went over to Woody's. And I came across Woody's because Smirnoff, they were starting to clash heads over there. So it was, him and Jerry weren't getting along. And um, Jerry came around and he's like, hey kid, you know, um, you're a little small. And it was weird coming from him because he was a small guy himself. And he's like, you're a little small, so we really can't book you anymore on our shows. Um, you might want to go talk to Woody because he wants to start booking some small guys. For him across the back is Michael May. Oh, wow. Oh, I like that. How do you like that, Woody? I became El Diablo, and I took over my uncle's old gimmick. He was the original El Diablo. We put the uniform on and Woody and a lady named Kathy Kearney was there and they were like, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, just gonna job you out because you look young. I was, I was still in my teens. Boy, Diablo, he came to wrestle tonight. I'll tell you right now. The thing of super came up. Like in Mexico, they're like, the, if you have like super in front of your name, it makes you a superhero, right? So you have like Super Astro and a, you know, a few others. And, I go, hey, why don't, why don't we just do like Super Diablo? And then Super Diablo was born. Person coming death though, August 10th, I'm gonna tear you apart, boy. You're going down to defeat to Super Diablo. I'm gonna... Hi again, fans. Pat Kelly here in the Bay Area Wrestling <laughs> Studios with this man, Radical Robbie Lee. Well, John Kelly. No, no, you know, my name is what? Pat Kelly. What? You know, I don't know a lot about sports, and I don't know a lot about wrestling. What? Me and my tag team partner, who I guess Big Steve Kane, we was at a, we was at a bar, and it was after a Cow Palace show or whatever, and um, Hawk and Animal were there, and we were interested in getting into wrestling, and uh, we went up and talked to him, you know, and uh, I forget which one it says. You want to wrestle, man? I'll smash you up. I can take your head and pop you like a grape, you know? And I said, really? Said, Come on, dude, seriously. How do you get into wrestling? And he said, you got to go to school. He really, you got to find a school. You got to learn, learn the bumps. You got to learn the ropes. You got to learn all the, you know, how to do things and how to do it right. Wow. The next day, sitting on TV, having a beer, and we turn on the boob tube, and there's uh, Barry wrestling. And you see Shane Cody, and we got the address from there, and there it was. And on the card, this man, the radical one, Robbie Lee. I got Wrestle Jose, what? No, no, we're wrestling in San Jose at Silver Creek High School. I don't think he quite understands me. Saturday Always liked George Animal Steel and uh, Bruiser Brody, so I put them two together and came up with the radical Robbie Lee. What? What? I was working with a guy called the Samoan Prince and my crazy gimmick. What? Shut up. What? Don't tell him everything. I was doing some crazy, goofy stuff. And this, I had this guy laughing so hard, he couldn't, he, he had a hard time wrestling, you know? Got him in a headlock and he goes, hey, brother, what's knock that shit off, man? I can't wrestle you. You're making me laugh, bro. Good move by Robbie Lee. I didn't know the man had any name, did you? Oh, oh, no, he stumbled coming back into the ring. But his feet are on the rope. And his opponent is now making his way to the ring area. He is the outrageous mass. Oh, no. oh, oh. 
Back when I was in elementary school, I can remember we were all out on the playground and, and talking about wrestling. At that time, it was on Channel 2, all-star wrestling, with Ray Stevens, Pat Patterson, Kenji Shibuya, Puffer Gomez. Here I am, this buck-toothed, four-eyed, nerdy-looking kid. <laughs> I told all the kids, someday I'm going to be a professional wrestler. Yeah, right, Randy. I said, someday you're going to see me on TV. Ah, uh, ha, ha, right, Randy. I proved all of them wrong. You know, anybody can be a follower, but I want you to be a leader. I want you to stand out from the rest the way the mask does. I knew Woody for a while. In fact, Woody is the one that trained me. I lost contact with him for a while. Woody got busy, I got busy, and uh, we connected one day, and he was telling me that he had a, a show on, on cable and uh, asked me if I'd like to be a part of it. Wait a minute, the mask going into his trunks. He's inserting that circular piece into his forehead. We might be looking. If he headbutts him, it's gonna be all over, Woody. We've seen this before. Oh no, he hurt his fist on it. And now there comes the headbutt. The silly string, a lot of people have asked me, how in the world did you come up with that? And I saw a comedian do it on TV as he was going out to the stage. He sprayed the the fans with silly string. And I, I thought, I like that. I like that. I'm going to get the, <laughs> I'm going to spray the fans with it. And uh, it went over. Woody was kind of skeptical of the silly string at first, but he saw that it was going over, the, the fans liked it, and it became part of the act. <laughs> Making his way to the ringside is the heartthrob, Rich Armas. I used to hate wrestling, you know? And uh, one day I, I seen, uh, it was Snooka, and he's sitting in a chair, and here's this guy in a skirt, and he's talking all kinds of shit to him, you know? And then all of a sudden, you know, Snooka turns his head like this, the guy hits him on the side of the head with a coconut. Gene Oakland comes on and goes, hey, they're gonna meet Oakland, call to see him tonight. And I go, oh, I gotta go watch this guy, he's gonna beat the shit out of this other guy, you know what I mean? I went and watched the match, man, I was just like amazed. And then uh, the next day in the newspaper, I seen Woody Farmer School. I just drove right down there immediately and checked it out. That took him, well, that took him didn't it? That took him well, down. Well, uh, I'll have to give, uh, give Armis a little bit of credit. Honestly, I fucking hated my gimmick. I hated it. I was uncomfortable doing it every single time I went out. Uh, and I'd come out as a Chippendale dancer. You know, I felt like I was no way in any kind of shape to be like looking like a Chippendale. And then have to gyrate my hips. I can't even fucking dance, you know what I mean? I can't keep beat to music for shit. And I gotta go out there and gyrate my hips in front of people. I guess it worked, you know what I mean? The crowd went wild, but I don't know if it's because the applause sign came on or what, you know? <laughs> Once again, the body slam goes, given off, landing on the mat. Armis comes over for a big leg drop. Let's first welcome to the ring area, Jammin' Jason Rogers. Where I heard of Bay Area Wrestling and Woody School was I was driving home one night, and this is, I don't know, maybe 1991. And I was listening to 98.5 KOME radio with Dennis Erectus, and uh, he had Shane Cody on. Uh, I called the radio station, and I said, oh, I'm a big fan. I didn't even know who this guy was. And I won tickets to their event that was upcoming, and um, that's how I heard. I, that's where I met Woody, and I was looking for a professional wrestling school at the time. I think Boris Kivanoff is somewhat surprised by the newcomer, Jason Rogers. I didn't think, uh, I don't think that Boris thought that he would have this many moves this soon at the top of the map. At Bay Area Wrestling, I used my actual real name. It was Jammin' Jason Rogers. Um, not very creative, but I just went with my own name and because, um, you know, the famous name of Rogers in professional wrestling. You know, I had the mullet hairdo. Um, I had tiger striped tights. Uh, you know, Rock and Roll Express were popular. The Rockers were popular. So I kind of a take on that, you know, rock and roll. With uh, those bows in the midsection, now sending the mask across the ring. They meet in the middle. Whoa, what a flying elbow. Let's first welcome to the ringside area, a fan favorite, Johnny Starr. Yeah. 
it was right after I got out of the Marine Corps. I went in the Marine Corps right out of high school, and my a good friend of mine was was really into it. So we went. We saw a live show at the Kaiser Convention Center. It was the NWA back in those days, in the um, late '80s. And I was like, man, this is this is the coolest thing I'd ever seen. You know, it was just awesome. Handsome Al being sent across the ring and a big drop kick sends him down. Covered by the champion in a two count. At the time, I was a team sir. I was working uh, uh, lumping trailers, which is you know you're hand loading trailers. And we found out that there's a school right around the corner from us. And at the time, it was um, ran by a guy named Jerry Monty. Jerry Monty and Woody were longtime friends, They'd long history together, you know, back coming up through wrestling. And Woody had offered his, his space to Jerry. So Woody had his school, but Jerry was doing a school on different nights. So I meet Woody like the, the, the next practice I'm there. He was watching us train and and he, he pulled me aside a little bit later and said, hey, you know, if you'd want to come on my days too, you know, you can. So I started going on both days. So I was going four days a week, boom, boom, boom. Woody at one point said, hey, you know, I've got this show that, that we do and I'm looking for guys, you know, if you'd like to do that. I ended up basically not going to Jerry's too much anymore and doing and switching over to Woody's. Johnny Starr showing us some reasons why he is the Bay Area Wrestling Heavyweight Champion. I tell you what, Johnny Starr, next time me and you get in the ring, I'm gonna knock you in the next week because you ain't no champion, I am. When I started wrestling, I, I went under my, my real name, Rex Farmer, I was babyface. Me and my dad did a couple shows. We did a show, uh, Grass Valley or some shit up there. We worked against uh, Alex Marinoff and Paul DeMarco. We're wrestling them, we're baby face, they're hills. The match is going on and it, it, it was a big house. It was a big house, it was packed. And I, I remember my dad out there just, he was working over Paul DeMarco. Paul DeMarco gets juice. You know, he's bling like crazy. And people started getting the, the, the Pepsi, remember the, the old tall Pepsi cans back in the day? The tall ones, they'd, they'd fold them up and, and into a ball and they was throwing at us. The rush I got from that, them all. I don't like the chairs, I, I like the booze. Wait a minute, here comes Shane Tony, bring the bell, bring the bell. Shane Tony in, taking the boots. And from there, I just, I just wanted to be a heel. I, I wanted to be hated. Here comes Black Eye Shane Tony, get him out of the ring. Oh my God! That's why I changed my name you know, because I didn't want to go under Rex Farmer because my dad's Woody Farmer. Oh, you know, and then you get, oh, you're here. Oh, you're, maybe you get put on main event because your dad's Woody Farmer. So at that time, my ex was pregnant with my son and we came up with his name, Shane. So then I'm thinking, what kind of gimmick am I going to get? Oh, let me play the cowboy gimmick. And so we looked up, Bucking all these cowboy people, oh, this this cowboy named Cody, and so so put it together, Shane Cody. But you know, I gotta say, Shane Cody can wrestle when he wants to. Yes, he can wrestle when he wants to. He, he knows more about wrestling. He'll forget more about wrestling. Earliest memory I can remember is being at the tapings. Growing up with wrestlers, to me, it was growing up with two of my idols. I had my father, Shane Cody, and my grandfather, Woody Farmer, who I idolize still to this day. You get tough bread real quick. Weighs in 142 pounds, lovely Lloyd! My mother was a valet for a long time. She was a very tough woman. It looks like lovely Lloyd. Oh, oh, she got on the side of the head with that belt. She would take no lip from somebody and would whip somebody literally with it. Prince grabs him. Here's Lori. Smacks him on the back. Smacks him right on the back with that big, big belt. She was a tough woman. Side headlock, good move. She went in there. Took her over, took her down. For this story, we went inside a small building in an industrial area of Hayward, and this is what we saw. The people don't realize what these guys go through to be a professional wrestler. And I told him, I says, hey, Pops, I want to I be a wrestler. He says, you don't want to get in this business. It's a cutthroat, backstabbing business. I said, no, I want to give it a try. So I started training at the school, but he wouldn't work with me at first. So I had the guys, it was the mask, 
and a guy named Boris Givenoff that was training me at first. So my first night of training, you know, get done and they, everyone takes off and I'm in the warehouse and I'm going to see how it feels to hit the ropes. After training, you know, you loosen up the ropes because you got all that pressure on each pull. So the, the ropes are loose. So I take off running, hit the ropes, fucking broke my bottom rib. So I had to keep on training with a broken rib. Woody is a professional wrestler and former champion who still goes out on the circuit for fun when he's not running his piano moving business or tending to his school. When they trained you, they trained you hard. Beat the shit out of you, man. In my first night when I started training with Woody, it was I got in the ring with a mask and they gave me 50 snap mares. And that was it. I, I just remember taking 50 snap mares, so and being very sore the next day. And plus that ring, that training ring. These rings we got now are like a fucking mattress compared to the ring we trained in. It was the old show ring, I guess they used at KTVU for Roy Shire's uh, big time wrestling. When he opened the school this year, he had a hundred applications, but he chose the students he thought had a chance at a career in the ring. Woody didn't think I'd make it through one session. Woody was having three sessions a day, morning, afternoon, and evening. He didn't think I'd make it through one. I made it through all three of them. I got pile-drived, and it pulled all the muscles in my back. And you know, I mean, it, I, I had to roll out of the ring and went back up to Shane Cody and smacked him, and he laughed and said, oh, okay, you got heart. This kid's got heart. And if you didn't go to training, you didn't get on the show. So you could be his top guy or his bottom guy, but if you didn't go, if you weren't showing up to training, you weren't on TV that week. Here I come, there's this big ass dude with his shirt off, and he's working on a dune buggy, you know, and he looks at me, he goes, so you wanna wrestle, huh? And I'm like, yeah, he goes, <laughs> just like that, you know, just kinda, of, how old are you? And I'm like, 17, he's like, uh, you just gotta get your dad to sign up, you know? So I was like, all right, so got my, got the old man to sign me up uh, right out of high school. And I was doing so good that they got me on the second day. I'm doing snappings over the top rope and I'm doing monkey flips off you know, feet. Rex goes and throws it. He goes, hey, he just says something. He goes, go on, do the monkey flip, you know? So he throws me and I go out of the corner. Or it was a monkey flip off the ropes, actually. We wanted to catch your feet in the stomach and kick you up. Well, each time I went over, I kept getting a little more nervous because I'd get a little more higher and higher. And then this last time I went over, man, I, I, I caught some air and I went, I guess it was kind of straight up. And then when I was coming back down, I started getting all squirrely. And so I twisted because I thought I was going to land on my neck and I broke my collarbone the second day of training. So I, I didn't come around for a couple weeks, you know. And then I came back to see the guys and, and I come walking in and all, Woody's like, hey, it's Mr. Brutal. And I'm like, what the fuck is this guy calling me Mr. Brittle for? I mean, and everybody's like, hey, Brittle, what's going on, Brittle? I'm like, what the hell's going on here? And I look at, <laughs> I look at Woody and go, why are you guys calling me Brittle? He goes, well, don't you know? And I go, what do you mean, don't I know? He goes, he goes, I was sitting here, and he goes, and here comes your dad in the door. He goes, you know, the, right a couple days after, you know, we you broke your collarbone, I go, yeah. He goes, he came up to me, he started yelling at me. He says, Woody, what are you doing to my son? Don't you know he's got brittle bones? I caught shit. I mean, they still call me brittle. You know what I mean? To this day, what is it, 32 years now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's fucked up, man. You know, I love this business. To me, this is the greatest business in the world and the greatest sport. And to teach these young guys the art of wrestling and the skill of wrestling and make wrestlers out of them is the greatest thing in the world for me. Pat, I think this is the greatest thing ever hit the Bay Area in a long, long time. And what's so great about it, it's going over so big now. It is really just, it's going all over the state. Where do guys go once, once they complete wrestling school? So he started, uh, started Bay Area Wrestling at the cable station there in Newark. I think the wrestling scene in the Bay Area, particularly, was in a lull before Woody came along. Pick up the mask! I can't believe this! What's going on here? There's Tom Franklin! There's Bo Snyder! We had good uh, quality wrestling. We had uh, all the wrestling characters. He's ready for a fight. He's Tom Franklin. He's a wrestler with experience who knows how to win a match no matter what it takes. Boris Gibanoff. Making his way to the ring area, he is known as Handsome Al. 
Wrestling skill along with a devious mind can be a lethal combination that best describes Kendo Miyazaki. This is the best thing that Bay Area Wrestling has ever seen. And his opponent is now making his way to the ring area. He is bad boy, Big Steve Kane. A ring veteran who has a tremendous opportunity this evening, Tony Choa. Welcome to the ring, the guy that'll take you back home down on the farm. By you, Billy. The man with the fire, the Samoan Prince. Martial arts are especially dangerous when used by this man, the ninja. The former kickboxer has adapted very well to the wrestling ring, Sonny Stone. I think we went on the air in 89, and it would run on television through 92 or early 93. The show took off, you know, from just uh, local access to Sports Channel. It's time to bring you up to date on events surrounding the world of Bay Area Wrestling, and here with a special interview is Wrestling World Magazine's Alan Bolte. As part of Tag Media... We filmed the events uh, every couple of weeks at the studio, and it was big enough that they could set the ring up completely, and they had about 100 seats, 90 or 100 seats for fans, and the camera work, announcer's table. It was tailor-made for a small indie promotion to, to get going. Remember, all you have to do is get a hold of us at the Bay Area Wrestling Hotline. It's Bay Area Wrestling. So Bay Area Wrestling, to me, was the, the, the top independent promotion in California because we had the TV. When I started, my debut was on television. That was very cool because not many guys can say, hey, my debut match was on television. And when I say television, it's not just like, you know, the local Newark area got it. It was seen on Sports Channel America, which was Washington, Oregon, California, and the western part of Nevada. And uh, we like to say uh, hello to you watching at home all up and down the West Coast. I think we were on every Saturday night about 7 o'clock. We taped twice a month, and, and then our show came out weekly. So, so we do two shows at a time. They had the first hour, then the second hour, then two weeks later they would do you know two more hours and then that's how they kept the, the TV somewhat current when they would show it on Sports Channel. When you had your little chart and you walked in and you seen where your place was on the show, it would have your time limit on there. And so let's say they said 10 minutes or 11 minutes, this guy's going over, this guy's going over. You knew that you had to be right on the money right there and that's what separated getting that experience and becoming a real professional. Woody would, would have it down, you know. Boom, when it's your time to go, you go. There was no jokes, you know, no games. Woody showed a lot of faith in us and, and, and we all wanted to repay that. We worked for free and we didn't have a problem with it. We're sitting and tearing apart that ring and putting it in a little, little studio where you have a wall and you have a little door and you're fighting to get the ring in and out. It never had no problem with it, doing this and working for free. We was getting, we was getting out there. You know, I think it was shot through Oregon, Washington, all through California. Nobody else had that. I'll tell you one thing, that's Shane. The winner is Chuck, you know, Johnny Star. Johnny Star. Right what are you talking about, about, boy? I'm Shane Cody, I'm right. Shane Cody and I do what I want. A lot of times we take a look at production that's 30 years old. And we go, oh my God, Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble must have been watching this shit, right? But you take a look at what Bay Area Wrestling was, and you take a look at that show, and for the day, that was damn good television. I'll tell you one thing, look, look at- It also compelled fans to want to come to the show and be a part of that taping. He's got a wrestling point. Johnny Starr said he came across the ring, had a big drop kick, and the fans respond. So for me, yeah, I don't know if it's ego or what, but I loved it. I loved coming out and seeing the fans. You know, they're all around the ring, and you'd, you'd start to see the same faces, especially as we were going, and especially once we, we were on Sports Channel. The crowd got into it. If you, if, you, if you worked them right, they got into it. And you feed off the energy, or the insults. And Shane Cody in the middle of the ring, proud as could be. Does he actually think the fans are gonna clap for him? In the cable station, it was loud, it was close. It was a rush, it was a big rush. It was a little warm in there at times, especially during the summertime, because you got all those big heavy lights, you know, for the TV tape. In the studio, hot. 
It was hot. No air, but it was fun. Side headlock goes the other mask. Down goes the mask. Take down. Those were nights were so fucking long. Um, I, I think we I think we'd get going at about seven o'clock or eight o'clock. We'd get done about eleven, and then we would do the promos. Quiet on the set. Ready. Go ahead. Stand by. Oh, yes, we're filming. Ready. Sure. Stand by. These days, in in most wrestling promotions, including mine or any television that I've worked in, you call them pre-tapes. That's because they're pre-taped before you go out and do the matches. Not so with Bay Area Wrestling. Uh, the boys would be dead tired. The production team would be dead tired. I would be tired, and then we had to do a bunch of promos like the matches had never taken place. But you know what? Now that I look back on it, 30 years after the fact, that's just another one of the things that Woody Farmer created that made that promotion and that television show so unique. Well, you know, Pat, I've been waiting a year to get into Bay Area Wrestling. I signed my contract, and I'm looking forward to climbing the ranks of Bay Area Wrestling. Um, I'm sure you're going to show some footage of some of my... Inter there, okay, so first off, there was absolutely no promo classes. It's either you had it or you didn't. That's right, Pat. May 1st, Eureka High School. I can't wait to be there. Because I want to be kicking tail at Eureka High School, May 1st. There were guys that could talk, and there was guys that couldn't talk. When I first started cutting promos, I was obviously nervous. Um, I wasn't in a comfort zone where I'd be like, uh, like the mask, the mask. If you saw some of the mask promos, they were good. Well, let me tell you something, you malignant dwarf. When I get my hands on you again, I am going to make you squeal like a pig. When we were doing interviews, he'd just, uh, give me an introduction and hand me the mic. The Mask winning his matchup this evening on Bay Area Wrestling with some surprising tactics. Well, it's not hard to surprise somebody that's got the mentality of a turnbuckle. One of my favorite wrestlers was Jesse Ventura. It was from Jesse that I got, let me tell you something. Well, let me tell you something, Kelly. Let me tell you something, Armis. Well, let me tell you something, fishnet swivel hips. Yeah, that's, uh, that's where he picked up my phrase there. Let me tell you something. And his opponent is now making his way to the ring area, the diabolical Spanish hitman. We had guys coming from all over the place to do our show. You know, we had this group of LA guys. Jesse Hernandez's guys. Let me first introduce to you, making his way to the ring area, the man from Guadalajara, Jesse Hernandez. Woody Farmer uh, called me and he asked me if I was interested in sending some of my, my boys uh, that we were training at the time. Yet another great athlete makes his way to Bay Area Wrestling, Wayne Bradley, Rick Redondo. Gary Key. Lucky Larry Ludden. Bobby Bradley. Now he told me, I can't afford to pay anybody, but I will take everybody out. I'll, 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 I'll fly to um, two for one on uh, Southwest, he said, and I'll pick you up at the airport, all you guys, and, uh, and also uh, give you a free meal. This man, Jesse Hernandez against the ropes. They're going toe to toe now as Hernandez fights back. We all went up there and had a blast. Uh, I think the boys learned a lot about TV, uh, you know, especially the younger guys that had never been on TV. And it really helped everybody out. Oh, one more. Shane Cody was a little stiff with everybody. but <laughs> I, th I think he's always been stiff. <laughs> Hi again, everyone. Pat Kelly here in the Bay Area Wrestling Studios with the great Pepper Gomez. And Pepper, what advice do you have for wrestlers starting out in the world of wrestling today? Well, you know, they've got a great, uh, great school here. That's one thing about Woody. Woody knew everybody. So we'd always get people popping in and they'd start training you for a little while. Pepper worked with me quite a bit. I really, really enjoyed the advice he'd give me and stuff he'd show me. The first night that Pepper Gomez came in, and I thought, oh my God, should I tell him that I saw him when I was like eight years old in the Cow Palace? Because fuck, everybody tells him that, it's gonna make him feel ancient. Just like working with, with Mula and Mae Young, I felt honored 
to, to be a part of that, that, that he was coming in to work with us. With me is the fabulous Moolah, legendary women's world champion. Moolah, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Pat. And I have to say, I guess I'm more excited than you are because I just witnessed the best studio wrestling I have ever seen. And a lot of the old timers, and, and they liked the show because it was, you know, more like the old time wrestling. Another wrestler who you may not have heard about so much, but, uh, I think a lot of real hardcore wrestling fans that watch this documentary will, will remember the name Clyde Steves, who was from the San Francisco Bay Area. He's now removing his mask, ladies and gentlemen, and it is Clyde Steves, our announcer at ringside, along with Woody Farmer, our very own color commentator on Bay Area wrestling. Clyde, it's very nice to be working with you. Woody Farmer is really set, getting ready to get his head torn off because I've got the man, the hit man, right here, boy. He will tear his head off and look for him. Of any of those, uh, well, any of those slaps, any of his body blocks, any anything. There's me, yeah, grabbing the boot of Gary Keith. Look at it. Hey, 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 hey. He's working that leg over. He's working that leg over. Our cameraman, Todd, at ringside, getting a good shot of that. Me Young and Fabulous Moolah were two of the toughest people, male or female, that I have ever met or probably will ever meet in this business. And a veteran like Woody Farmer still having a hard time detecting it. There's your shoelaces. Mae Young, as tough as she was, she had a heart as big as, big as this building. May was insane. There was no fear in that woman whatsoever. She's going up top. She's going up top. I can't believe it. Oh, no. I thought she was going to try to pin it for a second. Uh, May Young. Ah, uh, <laughs> that, that chip, that Chippendale. What are you don't talk to me about that Chippendale? What do you mean a Chippendale? Ed Rich Armors is a panty waist and a Chippendale. That was a rough old lady. <clears throat> I remember one time we were doing knee drops, you know, you know, I do a one-legged knee drop, kind of try to get up there, uh, up in the air high. So she go, yeah, get out, get out of my way here, Penny Waste. And she goes, let me show you how to do a real knee drop. And fucking laying there, and she fucking goes, hits the ropes and just drops both knees right across my chest. And I mean, bam, I'm like, Ugh. you know, gets up, and that's how you do a knee drop. <laughs> it's out of the ring, you know. Oh, no. That old lady was stiffer than shit. She beat the hell out of you, and I think she got off on it, seriously. Trying to tear apart the face of Jason Rogers right above us. Now May Young is choking him, and the back is turning. Come on, May, get off of him. She'd get excited. When the bad guy, you'd hear, we'd be watching the guys wrestle, and fucking bad guy starts hitting the guy, and she'd go, yeah, yeah. Uh, did any of the guys do, yeah. When she'd see pain, she'd start panning. And she, here we are on TV, and she's all, ah, ah, ah. What are you doing, Jack? Get up, Johnny! These guys are just, <laughs> we can't have this happening, because, you know, she starts seeing pain, and then she's all fucking pinned, and I'm getting fucking phone calls. Why is this lady fucking pinned? I remember I had to work my uncle, right? Mae Young is in the back, and as I'm beating up on Danny, she's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, that Danny Garcia. He sure is looking fantastic. The referee's letting Danny Garcia get away with murder. May didn't forget any of us when she made it to the big leagues. I went in and I did a tryout for the WWF, and I ended up getting a tryout. Some of the video that I had from Barry Wrestling, from other promotions I had, I put one big pack together, and I sent it. They gave me a tryout. May comes up. And instead of her congratulating me for finally getting a tryout to the WWE, she's like, oh, Diablo, how's your uncle? I love Danny Garcia. <laughs> Does he still look the same? <laughs> Why didn't you bring Danny with you? <laughs> Goes to show you that you never forget where you came from, and she didn't. She was determined that she was going to be in the ring at 100. And Vince McMahon promised her, if you make it to 100, we're going to have a big birthday bash in the ring for you. She wanted me to be her valet. 
<laughs> Unfortunately, she didn't quite make it. She made it to 90. And I talked to her just a couple days before she passed away and we reminisced about our, our days in the uh, LIWA, Ladies International Wrestling Association. She was uh, quite a woman. There will never be another Johnny Mae Young. I'm not only one of the uh, pioneers of girl wrestling, but I'm the greatest girl wrestler that ever walked into the ring. Our junior heavyweight guys, there is some great wrestling too, I mean. They're some of the finest in the business. Uh, I, you, you can't go any place in the country and see light heavyweight wrestlers. Most of them are real heavyweights or giants. But here is the only place in the United States that I can, you can find light heavyweights. It was a beautiful time as to what happened because Woody, I know with this light heavyweights, he gave us the rings and he said, run with it. Um, because he knew that there was something getting ready to change in the business. In the Bay Area Wrestling Studios, it's Pat Kelly once again with this man, Johnny Pearson. And Johnny, I have to say that I was really, really, well, worried about that shoulder injury you sustained just a few weeks ago. I'll tell you, Pat, I was hurt. I was down, I was out. But the fan support I'm getting has been tremendous. You better believe I'm going to be back there in Pittsburgh on July 10th. I'm going to be looking for a fight. Watch it. Mikey Lockwood was someone from day one that I saw train that I knew that if he kept that attitude and he kept working hard and he had a tremendous work ethic, that he would succeed in the business. Now that's an interesting call, Woody, and almost a hopscotch move, end over end, going across the ring. And right back to hold that arm again. Johnny Pierce, I mean, he was, he was a good, he was a good, good wrestler. We used to call him the bologna kid, because he, all he'd do is have bologna sandwiches, eat bologna sandwiches, you know? I'd be out in the car eating bologna sandwiches, little, little guy. Then he'd get in the ring, and you'd chuck him around and throw him around, and he'd bounce back like a Super Bowl. Boing, boing! I guess some bologna sandwiches paid off. Crash Holly, a lot of the guys who became big worked for Woody. You Mike. Johnny Crash, you know, wrestling, right? Started at Bay Area Wrestling. He learned from Woody. When I started training people at the school, I wasn't nice with them. I'd beat the shit out of them. Johnny Pierce, I used to beat the crap out of that guy. We was doing something, me and Johnny, and I'm training them, and I had my hand down in the front guy did a knee drop. Well, one knee hits my back, and the other knee hits my ring finger. And well, shatter dislocate right there. You know, here I go in, 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 into surgery, you know, put it back together. But it's something that, you know, Johnny Pearson will always be here. Training with him was fine. I mean, we'd all train, but with him, it was always cool. He was always doing like high flying stuff. So I was like, oh, wow, look at that. That, that, that dude can do some cool things. That was a beautiful high fly off of that rope. Later in life, uh, after uh, Bay Area Wrestling went uh, folded, we went to Mexico together for the, our first time to uh, go down and train with uh, Felipe Homley. And we met uh, with a trainer at the time, was Kanek. So that was a part of my life that was really cool with him. We both experienced that together, going down there together. Mike was a good man, and uh, I miss him. Sometimes when I think about those days, it's, it's unfortunate. So. I briefly had a stint in Bay Area Wrestling with promoter Woody Farmer, and many adventures were had. Yet another able competitor is ready for action on Bay Area Wrestling, Chris Jericho. That was Chris Jericho's first televised match ever. The handsome one, and I use that term loosely, <laughs> handsome Bell against uh, Chris Jericho. So when I went down there, I had three matches, and it's funny because they are included in the complete list of Jericho. Uh, my first match, August 7th, 1992, that was against Shane Cody. 
And that was uh, Woody Farmer's son. Getting sent across the ring, coming back now. Tremendous takedown. Jericho rolls Cody up and gets a two count. He, he was real smooth. It was a pleasure to work with him. The chant of the fans going out here in the Bay Area Wrestling Studios as Chris Jericho making a tremendous move. Beautiful move there. He was hungry. He worked harder for where he's at. Won by DQ because I was hit by the cowbell. Cody across the ring. Qualification. Then the second match was against uh, Handsome Al. That was on August 21st, two weeks later. I got that win with a big flying fist off the top rope. And he's coming down. Wow. Handsome Al took all of that one. And there's a three count. And then the third match was August 21st as well. And I lost to the Spanish hitman via a side slam. That's when Mae Young held my foot. No, it's reversed. Side suplex, and the three count, winner of this one, Spanish Hitman. She held my leg so hard, she punched me on the floor like this. I was like, who is this crazy old lady? Why is she beating me up? Mae Young, taking Chris Jericho at ringside. How did the kid up in Canada end up all the way there? So my dad was dating a, a lady who's now his wife and has been for over 25 years. Um, that was living in Palo Alto, California. So he was spending a lot of time going back and forth between Canada and, uh, and, the, and the, basically the Bay Area. He was telling me about this wrestling show that he saw on Sports Channel America. It was called Bay Area Wrestling. Don't wait. Call the Bay Area Wrestling Hotline now at area code 510-783-8033. That's 510-783-8033. And I was thinking at the time, I was working in Canada, I'd had one tour of Japan, but I didn't really have anything going on. And I thought, maybe if I go to California and I get on Sports Channel America, people will see me nationwide and then want to book Chris Jericho. Maybe the WWE will see it, or maybe WCW will see it. People, look at those uh, Andre kickdowns, big body slam, Chris Jericho. I first went there, and I think I'd been contacting them via phone, maybe wrote a letter back in those days, and they were kind of a little bit hesitant. Like, I'm sure they had a million guys trying to show up and try and get on, you know, TV's TV. So I showed up at this big kind of, I guess, warehouse where, where Bay Area was, was, was based out of. And it was kind of a little bit of a training center. So I came in and they were kind of asking, well, where have you wrestled, who have you trained with? And of course, I trained at the Hart Brothers. So Woody Farmer kind of knew that because he was an old school guy, probably worked in Calgary, at least knew who Stu Hart was and Stampede Wrestling, what they were all about. And the one tour of Japan was kind of real currency at the time because nobody was really going to Japan at that point. So it's like, oh, you've been to Japan? You must be okay, but you're gonna have to show what you, what you can do uh, at the practice. Defense sends Jericho across the ring. Jericho on top of the hitman, turning it into a sunset flip up. But there was one of the guys who was a referee, a blonde haired guy, and he was fairly good. So he and I kind of did some high spots and kind of showed what we could do in this warehouse uh, in order to get booked at the TV taping. And lo and behold, I must have impressed them because I was then booked. I remember he, uh, Woody and I uh, and Alan talking about, hey, this, this Jericho kid looks pretty good. I think he might make it. <laughs> I don't really think that I got too much of a response from being on Sports Channel. Keep on, this was pre-internet, so there was no Twitter or anything to see if anybody saw it. But what really helped is there was a guy there called Alan Bolte, and he was the ring announcer. But he was also a, a writer, and he wrote for a magazine called Wrestling World. And that was a big national magazine, sold all over the country. The editor pretty much gave me carte blanche on what wrestlers I wanted to write about. I sent in on Chris Jericho. We got together, had lunch, did some pictures, and he provided me with some action pictures that he had and shots from the TV studio. So we did a whole article on him about his wrestling for the Mexican Federation, Lucha, his band that he played his BAW, Bay Area Wrestling experiences. So people did see me in this national magazine that wouldn't have um, if I hadn't have gone there. Across the ring goes Jericho, sunset flip. It was all very cool to just be there and be, be working with different people and kind of seeing how, how it was in another area of the country. 
Overall, it was very much worth me going there and doing it. And like I said, I have great memories about it. And that's why I wanted to be involved in this documentary because it was a very short period of time, but it's something I vividly remember and I'll never forget. And once again, I'm very thankful they gave me the opportunity to wrestle three times there uh, for free. Well, you know, it's, uh, it all came together. Kurt White goes, hey man, you, you guys should do the three generation. And I'm all thinking, fuck, you know, it's never been done. You know, I mean, the funks, uh, the Von Erics, the, the Hearts, the Guerreros. It's always been a father's son. My grandfather was 72. And that is something I will never forget. You know, I had my grandfather, my dad, wrestlers, and then here I am like this little dork trying to be like them. Come on, James! Everybody knew my name by then already. And you'd go out there and because of them, they were chanting riot. And that was, that was cool. It was a good show. It was uh, me, Diablo, and Jason Styles, And we wrestled them, man. It was, it was a, a brutal match. I mean, Woody lit me up. I'm glad that I got the opportunity to do that. You know, we did four shows, uh, three generation, and um, it was awesome. Woody, that's gonna do it for this time on Bay Area Wrestling. It's been fun with the final bell having rung. That'll do it for this edition. We wish to thank all of the fans here in our studios in Newark, California, and you, the viewers at home, for tuning in. You don't want to see a good movie end, you know? As good as the movie was, you don't want to see it end. And it ended. Hey, let's quit arguing. We got to go away. And we'll see everybody next week on Bay Area Wrestling. Say goodnight, mate. Good night. I think, I could be wrong. I think it folded because, you know, Woody, to do what he did, he used a lot of his own money. He didn't, you know, ask people for money to help. He used his own money. Because he didn't have to do that. You know, he could have been like the rest of the guys. Fuck, you go out and fucking do the way we had to do. Find it. But he wanted to give everybody a platform to learn and train and, and you know, have a chance of making it because it was all about exposure back then. I'm going to tell you one more thing, too. I'm getting real tired of it. And come May 16th, man, you're going to have a real big surprise. Got a lot of exposure. Well, you know, put a lot of exposure out there. And, and, and I would say you put a, um, if it wasn't for Woody Farmer, um, Crash Holly wouldn't, you wouldn't be where, you know, got where he was at. And um, a lot of wrestlers wouldn't have got where they're at, you know? I mean, he put a, he put a, a footing up to get recognized. You know, that's why Chris Jericho came through, you know, to get recognized. But it was heartbreaking. I mean, it was something we all loved. And when it stopped, it was just like, oh, you know, it was, it was, it was sad, it was a sad day. We all kept in contact and we, we kept, a lot of us kept doing shows, you know, for other people and things. And then um, Kirk started doing his thing and so I'd run in a lot of the guys. A great time in my life. Um, I'll always reflect on those days and uh, be thankful and grateful for all that uh, I was able to do. I wish we could have done more together, but uh, like they say, all good, uh, all good things must come to an end. If you leave this business with five friends, that's, you're a hell of a guy, right? They say, people fucking love you. You know, you did your job, you didn't cut no throat, you didn't do anything. I left this business like this, with a lot of friends. I wouldn't trade it for the world, man. I met a lot of good people, with Shane Cody. He was the guy, my rival, when I, I, I fought as a baby face. And Cody and himself becoming the Bay Area Wrestling Champion when uh, Cody had the belt. And now he's a baby face and I'm a heel, go figure, you know? And we still fight each other. <laughs> Bay Area Wrestling was the best. We became the best friends and, and I mean, me and Shane, we, we came like family, his son, you know, his mom. <laughs> Spent a lot of time with him when, when when he had cancer. We walked and you know and 
He, you know, he always had my back, you know, and I had his back. He was just a great man. Oh man, there's so much I wish I could say to my grandfather today, all the things I've learned since he's been gone, but the one thing I wish I could say is how much I miss and love him. Very proud of my father, very proud of my grandfather, and it's, it's been a blessing to be a part of the family. Ah, well, Woody, thank you. Appreciate uh, you know, everything you did for me, and I had a lot of good times, good memories, you know. A lot of good brothers in, uh, in the ring. God, God bless you, Woody. Rest in peace, my friend. It's been many years since you passed, but I'm still in the ring doing my thing. Through me lives you, and through my training, and I show the next group of guys, the next WWE superstar like a Bailey or anybody in the past, it all starts from Woody Farmer. I know he's looking down at us right now, uh, smiling. Woody, <laughs> I love you. I just want to thank him for giving everybody the opportunity to work at Bay Area Wrestling. You know, I just wish he was here for another week where I could get to wrestle him or wrestle against him, with him, or just travel down the road with him. I just want to thank him for everything he did for me. If May Young wants a match, believe me, May, you have got a match. You bring all these guys in here, especially the Hitman, and when I get through with you, May, it's not going to be a pretty sight. Perfect. Hit him upside the head with a Spanish piano. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm. Let me tell you something, Armis. I'll tell you something in a minute. You know <laughs> it's like a ride. Okay. <laughs> We've been on plenty of rides. Today. That was the most boring ride. See the action of Bay Area Wrestling God in Pittsburgh. Now, I don't know who you are, Mask, or what you are, but I do know one thing. You're as yellow as the man that you are when you're wearing that mask. May, let's say goodnight. We'll see you next week on Bay Area Wrestling. Say goodnight, May. Goodnight, May.